Hello everyone, and welcome to Saturday. The day where it's okay to be sad, even though it's a weekend. <sighs> sad things, what can I say? We had a few first pass. Two names that come off hand would happen to be Cheezer and um, Konaru. But um, I'm sure there's probably quite a few more that I just can't seem to remember at the moment. That being said, I want to enter us into a place of calm and somber by playing one of my favorite sad pieces on my ocarina. I'm not very good at it, but yeah, I'll try. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to need a lot more practice. Anyway, um... Now for... What I, per, what I hope to be a somber piece here. This one's called Konaru by the Forsaken Scribe. I wrote this recently, so... Yeah. Our soupial who worked on many a car, I met you in a bar, bouncing full of life, absence wrought with much strife. Your hugs and purrs in the chest, devotion to character simply the best, in hellish heat you grilled our meat, never once leaving your suit, spontaneous and dependable, others say you did recruit, oxytocin and love your chemical, black, blue, green, and yellow, you were sweet and caring fellow, gone away before your time. Up above your heavenly climb, us below may never know until it is time to go. Peace and tranquility, a soul complete, your body beneath our feet. Though we gather around and weep, memories of your deeds we keep, until at last we reunite and fly in the great furry convention in the sky. Thank you. And now you by the Forsaken Scribe, which is for anyone else I might have missed that died and is very much a generalized... Um, Peace. And it goes like this. I knew from the very day we met, you weren't like the others. Your eyes had seen right through me. You knew that I was cynical and hopeless. A glimmer of light remained stubborn amid the darkness. It was invisible to most others, but you saw it clear as day. How did it come to be that when I thought I'd lost it all, when I thought my game was over, you were there? I stared into the fire, ready to throw it all away. You stopped me and showed me true happiness. I wanted for not but someone to understand the method to my madness, to embrace me for who I am. I'm sorry I could not be this light for you. Although you are gone, the light burns brighter than ever. We are one, and as long as I remember you, you'll never truly die. Thank you. All right, and that's pretty much the um, poems that I brought for this. So I'm gonna give you a little ex something extra this show was admittedly a little rushed to put together, but um, it is what it is. Got to do something every week. And so I figured, you know, none of you have ever actually heard this particular story before. So this one's called New Life, New Strife. It's an alternate universe fiction where, let's just say some of the characters from my original series, as well as, you know, some of the creepy pastas I've written are more or less rewritten to be completely different than what they were. And see if you can spot any personality similarities between the various characters here. If you can't, it's fine. You probably didn't read it or 
you probably didn't know about it, but it's okay. <laughs> For everyone else, it should be a pretty interesting story. Chapter 1, Bummer Summer. Dateline, June 22, 1998. A cat family moves into a new neighborhood and a new school district and presumably a new neighborhood as well. Our, new, our main character, we will call him Claude. It should be noted that in every universe there exists a different iteration of Adam, Nico, Kit, 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 Kat, and, and Isaac thanks to the events and tales of extraordinary beings. To avoid confusion when worlds collide, I'll rename them accordingly. However, it should be fairly obvious to fans of the first series which characters had the carryover of which. They can also see into other possibilities, be it through visions or dreams they have connected to certain places. That's about all the exposition you need to know to understand this. Mom says, hey Claude, can you help us bring in your toys? Claude said, alright. Claude and his family brought in all the stuff. Claude said, remind me again why you decided to wait till summer to move? It is so freaking hot. Or one to use an outdoor thermometer would read 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Mom said, well, I thought it would make the move on you easier if you didn't have to suddenly switch schools without getting a chance to acclimate to the new neighborhood. Claude said, if you say so. He splashed himself with water as he and the no less sweaty movers helped him, them bring it all in. Little did he know the neighbor across the bedroom window was watching him the whole time. The scene transitions to his neighbor's house. Louis, I've prepared a basket of sweets for our neighbors. Will you be a dear and deliver them for me? I said, yes, Mom. For the sake of avoiding confusion, Claude's parents are Mary and Jack, while Louis's are Louis and Paul. Louis and Paul, rather. They said, okay, narrator, I think they get it. Claude said, what Louis said, wait, how are we both hearing each other and you? Cue the Twilight Zone <laughs> theme. With that convenient distraction out of the way, the story resumed. The packing scene transition finished and Claude lay in his bed sitting, sipping a pineapple juice drink out of a carved out pineapple. Then came the all too familiar doorbell sound. I said, Claude, the doorbell rang. Claude said, here's a crazy idea. How about you answer it? You're downstairs. Mary sighed and opened the door to the San Joaquin Kit Fox. Mary said, oh, aren't you adorable? I'm Mary and you are. Louis replied, I'm Louis. It's a pleasure to meet you. My mom sent me here to bring you this gift basket. He handed over the gift basket. Mary said, oh, how thoughtful. Please come in. I got a son about your age in a den room visible from the balcony opposite the stair railing. Louis's tail swayed slowly as he walked up the stairs on invitation to find Claude reading a poetry book. Louis said, what are you reading there? Claude said, oh, hey, I'm reading Into the Mind, Out to Nature, Musings of an Interesting Man. Product placement. <laughs> Louis said, oh, well, I'm Louis, and you are? Claude said, oh, I'm Claude, and because we're going to pretend the fourth wall didn't break just several lines ago and that we can't read each other's names in the script, the phone rang. <laughs> Louis said, Claude, the fourth wall construction company called and said, stop breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, that's a recurring theme across all my fiction. <laughs> Claude said, tell him to feck off, it's my story. The scene transitioned with a sorry we're having some technical difficulties on the screen a reading audience could see. <laughs> the scene resumed. I said, so Claude, I see you're new to the neighborhood. I said, yeah, I just moved in. I hated the old neighborhood and I don't imagine I'll get on any better in a new school. I said, well, I'm not going to lie and say that the Furlington Elementary is in any way better than wherever you're from, but I'm a genuinely nice person and would be honored to help you settle in. I said, I appreciate the offer, but it'd be social suicide for you to help me. Louis said, not really. I'm not exactly that popular myself. Claude said, then I'll either be setting myself up for social failure or we'll end up forming the Losers Club with a bunch of other misfits and basking how unpopular we are. Definitely not a reference to um, Pennywise or anything. <laughs> Louis said, geez, you sure are negative. What the heck did your previous school do to you? Claude said, well, first grade was hellish as they still taught cursive writing and expected me to just pick it up. Moreover, I had to be disguised as a human because they hadn't yet signed up to accept her a lot. Also, everyone laughs at me when I try to do push-ups, and on top of that, it was built to make failure the norm. I said, well, you'll be happy to know most of us do our schoolwork on a little invention called a computer. They rent out laptops to all students which have lost, stolen, or damaged our parents pay for. I said, well, that's a relief. I said, also, for the P requirement, you could do volunteer service in your community instead. I said, I guess it won't be so bad. I said, trust me, man, just give it a chance. In the meantime, we all have we have all summer to do what we want. I said, well, what do people do for fun around here? I said, lots of things. There's parks all over the place with tree houses built in collaboration of local scouts and park rangers. If the great outdoors isn't your thing, we got a bowling alley with all kinds of game modes, an arcade, a shopping mall, a junkyard. 
several local eateries with an atmosphere of their own. I said, it all sounds pretty interesting, but I should warn you, I'm not the best at competitive play. I lost many friends to a game of capitalist takeover on copyright monopoly. And sorry, I'm not sorry. Pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Louis laughing. I hate those games, too. In the end, they decided to watch Oy Vey Goyam on the TV. It was episode one where Mordecai burned the Chala. Both were laughing their hard, their little foot paws flailing adorably as they were doubled over with laughter. Louis said, Louis, dinner is ready. Come on home now. I said, this was a lot of fun, Claude. I hope we can have more tomorrow. Claude said, I agree. Sorry if I was a little gloomy at first. I kind of moved here for a reason. Also, I should mention, if I try to avoid doing anything, please don't make me do it. I'll explain when the time is right. In the meantime, let's have some fun while summer is on. I said, all right, I understand. Louis waved goodbye and darted home. Louis said, did you have fun with the new neighbor? Louis said, yeah, he's a bit rough around the edges, but I think we will be okay as, as long as we respect each other's requests. Paul said, how nice. Though I have a weird vibe about him. It's like maybe in another life we knew him. Jack said, well, Claude, it looks like we just moved in, but already made a new friend. What an accomplishment. I said, yeah, but I'm going to keep him at arm's length. If people get too close to me, they get scared of me, or so I found. I said, oh, come on. Come on now. He doesn't seem like the type to turn on someone over trivial things. But says, because you don't see what they do. I said, so sometimes they see your inner thoughts and fantasies. Big whoop. Claude said, yeah, big whoop. <laughs> the two adorable males went to their bed in their respective homes. The final scene transition for this chapter read, end of chapter one. <sighs> wow, that was a lot to unpack. Claude's fantasies, those close to him can see. How will this affect his friendship with Louis? Find out as the chapters go on. To be continued. New Life, New Strife, Chapter 2, Swimming in Silliness. Date line, June 23rd, 1998. Claude awoke to hear a familiar voice. Hey, neighbor, how about we hit the park? Their pool is open. I said, I'm not much for swimming, but I suppose it won't be so bad if I hang on to the edges. Hold on, we'll get the car, Louis. I said, no need, the park is a mere five-minute walk. Claude said, all right, Louis. Claude changed into his swimsuit wall a house, well, in, the, in the house, a towel covering him wearing swim shoes. Claude's swimsuit was one of those early 1900s swimsuits that covered you from chest to knees. Louis came out in his swim trunks and towel around his tummy and laughed. Louis said, oi, what you hiding from me? You're not a girl. Claude said, oh, you mean the swim shirt? Eh, I used to wear trunks like you until someone laughed at me when I was brave enough to go out and just swim trunks. Not that I mind it much, since I'm hardly naked enough to justify it with this. I said, well, if I gotta be honest, you probably look funnier with the swim shirt than without. Claude shrugged and proceeded with him. Louis threw his, his paw print towel aside. Jumped in the pool and began paddling, his fluffy tail swishing like a rudder. Claude walked down the steps of the pool cautiously, his two tails rotating in circles like a submarine propeller as he, too, began swimming, others noticing his swim shirt but not seeming to make much of it, as he'd be more likely to get attention with less on you than more. I said, well, for what it's worth, it sure beats heat getting heat stroke on land. The summer's been relentlessly humid. I said, I know what you mean, and hey, free entry of the limited hours is not a terrible deal. I said, well, I hope for, your, for our sake nobody went. The smell of chlorine is awfully strong. I said, don't remind me. I'm going to have to shower after this. I said, well, I suppose it isn't too bad as long as no one got food poisoning. I said, you thinking what I'm thinking? I said, what? I was handed Claude a laminated song sheet and both chortled reading it silently. I said, are you seriously suggesting we sing this? I said, why not? We're, we're kids. No one will think anything of it other than maybe disgust. Both of them started singing, diarrhea, 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 let me go, diarrhea, let me go, all the way down the toilet, all the way down the toilet, diarrhea, let me go, diarrhea, let me go. Their song was met with mixed reactions from other children laughing at the song to parents looking disgusted and face palming, which only made the laughter loud from all involved. Then the pool turned yellow. I said, ew, let's get out of here. I said, right behind you. They told themselves off and ran quickly. I said, well, not to worry, we have a kiddie pool at home. It's just difficult to temperature control or a sprinkler we could run through. I also have a mega drench gun on copyright super soaker. I said, cool, but I need to shower off first and change out of these. I said, yeah, me too. I can't believe we made other kids laugh so much they peed. I thought that only happened in movies. <laughs> Both laughed as they went in their separate houses, washed themselves clean with special chlorine, fur, shampoo, conditioning, and body wash. 
Once clothed into some comfortable white t-shirts and khaki cargo shorts, they both pulled out their water toys and began spraying each other repeatedly on the shared lawn space. I said, I got you. I said, I got you back. Once both had their fill of soaking each other, Mary called for both Claude and Lois. Heeding the call that came from the backyard, one could see from the smoke coming from Claude's backyard that a barbecue was on. I said, since Lois's mom was so kind to get us that gift basket and you seemed to go on, get along so well together, I had Jack throw them a gratitude barbecue. Lisa said, you boys didn't get into any trouble, did you? Well, I said, not particularly, why? Mary said, well, I saw some of our neighbors come home with crying children from the direction of the park I was in and I heard you two had gone. We haven't said anything to them. Well, I said, I'm not sure if it's trouble, but we did break into song and get people laughing. Lisa said, please tell me it wasn't the diarrhea song. I told my son not to read that in public pools. Well, I said, oh, I didn't know, but yes, it was. Both Jack and Paul left as, this is exactly, as if this is exactly the kind of thing they'd, they'd have been up to at their age. Mary said, don't encourage them. <laughs> Lisa said, we talked it over and agreed that since no one pressed charges, we'll let you off the hook. But do it again and you're grounded for a week with no TV, no internet, no video games, and no friendly outings. Both Lewis and Claude nodded understanding. Paul said, if the ladies are about done, I'm hankering for a wiener. <laughs> Lewis and Claude laughed so hard they had to pee and ran to different bathrooms with them. Same house, and then came back outside to eat. The delicious hot dogs and nachwurst and various soda flavors were consumed by all involved. Claude and Lewis pulled out some lawn chairs and brought them to the front lawn and laid them side by side as the sun set. Their bellies were distended from eating so quickly as they let up collective burps of varying noise levels and laughed. Lewis said, it just doesn't get better any better than this, am I right? Claude said, for sure. Suddenly, Lewis was silent. Claude said, you okay, Lewis? Lewis said, did you see that? See what? Never mind. Lewis shivered after that statement as the sun set. Claude comforted Lewis with a hug while they sat side, side by side, a slight blush on their face. Author's notes, oh, what a cute way to end a chapter. No outro needed this time. You may be wondering, what did Lewis see that prompted him to shiver? Why did Claude hug him? Does Claude know more than he's let on so far? Find out in the next few chapters. And we get to New Life, New Strife, Chapter 3. Now, before I go on, you're probably wondering, that's not sad. Well, not yet. It's about to be, though. I actually broke into tears writing this third chapter here. And then the fourth chapter would be a little better for maybe Monster Monday, but I might just read it anyway, because, you know, it kind of goes along with this anyway. Alrighty. <clears throat> chapter 3, Cuddles and Confessions. Dateline, June 24th, 1998. It's a beautiful scene. The, after a beautiful scene the previous night, Claude was surprised to find his friend wasn't out and about like usual. Claude said, "Huh, he isn't here. Normally he's here yelling up the window." I said, "It's matter, huh?" Claude said, "Nothing." I said, "Well, don't worry. So he doesn't do the one thing he's done the last two days. It isn't that unusual. It's part of settling in." Claude said, "I suppose, but I'm just worried. He seems so scared. Like maybe he saw a vision. Then he turned red when I hugged him. He didn't tell me anything." I said, well, considering he didn't run at any point, maybe it wasn't a bad vision. Well, I said, but what was, it, what, what was I thinking of then? Or was it not even a conscious thought? Claude took a walk to town, seeing not a sign of stirring next door. He went to the nearest library where he spotted a notice board with camp signups. Hmm, camp curious, I wonder. He grabbed a couple of contact tabs and headed for home. Lewis woke up unusually late with a yawn. I wonder if he's up yet. Went outside to... Uh, Yell up to Claude, hey Claude, you want to play? No response, Claude. No res still no response. Dejected, he went inside and hung his head crying. Lewis said, hey Lewis, don't be sad. So he didn't respond to you. Maybe he slept in too. He wiped tears from his eyes. He said, doubtful. Lewis <laughs> said, maybe he just needs a little time for himself. He did just move in and isn't used to having friends for long. Maybe just give him a space. I said, fine. Lewis said, what? Watching TV, he looked at the screen sadly. It's just not the same without him. Just then, a, a knocking, and Luis uh, opened the door. Oh, hi, Claude. What's this? Oh, how fun. What? No, he's up and inside. Luis ran to the door. Claude said, hey, Luis. Nice to see you. I said, oh, hey, Claude. Where you been? Oh, well, I found it unusual you weren't giving me the wake-up yell from my house, so I went, wandered for a walk and found the number to a s summer camp. I'm not much for outdoors, but you might like it. I said, well, you're not wrong, but I'd miss you terribly if you didn't come. Besides, you might like it more if you have someone you're comfortable with there. 
I said, well, I'm not sure when I leave my parents for too long, but I have an idea. I said, yeah? I said, well, summer camp doesn't begin until July 2nd. Perhaps we can both have a sleepover for the other. That way, if we do okay, maybe we're good to camp. I said, great idea. Then if it turns out we don't like sharing a room for extended periods of time, we won't have to do it for two months. Both of them turned to their respective mother. Can we do it, Mommy, please? They spoke to each other and their partner and came back. All right, you two, we'll do it. We uh, said, since Claude's family held the barbecue last night, he'll stay with us tonight. And I said, yay, I can't wait to show you my room, and we'll stay up late, and we'll have snacks, and we'll watch movies, and before Louis got too carried away, the scene transition to that night happened. After a delicious dinner, Louis brought him to the bedroom and turned on the TV. I said, hey, um, where am I supposed to sleep tonight? <laughs> Louis said, oh, don't worry, my bed can easily fit us both, since we're so small. <laughs> Claude looked around and to see that Louis put a pillow and, and a cushion backing on the foot of the bed. So how will this work? Louis said, well, I figured you'd not want to smell my paws or hold on to me, so if we lay in opposite directions, neither would be an issue. Claude blushed a bit. But it would tickle if either of us kicks in sleep. Louis said, then I guess try laying the other way, or maybe sit up more. I mean, I don't take up that much space. Claude sighed and lay across from him. I said, you know, we, we won't be sleeping like this in camp. I'm pretty sure each camper gets their own bed, or at least one built for two, not, not a twin bed. I said, I know, Claude, I just... I tried not to cry. I was so worried when you didn't answer me at your window. I thought maybe I'd hurt you with my remarks about your swimsuit the other day. Claude said, when you weren't there when I woke up, I thought maybe you'd seen something in my unconscious mind that scared you off like the others. I said, I'm sorry, Claude, I shouldn't have assumed you'd been ignoring me when you were just out for a walk. Claude said, I'm sorry, I... I assumed you were just like the others. I'm just so afraid of being alone again. By the way, what did you see? I said, well, I saw you hugging me and a bunch of hearts around you. It was weird because you'd always struck me as the sort of cool, not showing much emotion type. I said, why did you shiver? I said, well, you'd... I'd seen you laughing maniacally as the whole school burned. I said, impossible. I've never had a fantasy that dark, not even for them. I said, wait, you know about the visions I saw? Claude said, when people get close to me, they start seeing the visions I do. Some are extreme expressions of my emotions I feel in the moment. Others appear to be premonitions of the future. That's why I told you, if I ever seem reluctant to do anything, don't make me do it. I don't want to risk becoming that monster you saw. No one understands. I never asked for this. I wish I could just be a normal child, but I can't. It's killing me inside. He cried silently, sniffling. Louis hugged Claude and tears himself as beautifully somber music played in the background. The author recommends either Two Sunsets by Ludovico Inadi, as it's a pretty romantic scene, or It's Hard to Say Goodbye by Michael Ortega. Since it's a pretty sad scene, albeit not funeral levels of sad. <coughs> Louis said, You're not a monster. Everybody has feelings, some good, some bad, and everyone deserves someone who cares. He cries a little louder as if he just opened a wound he'd suppressed for a long time. I said, it's okay to let it out. I'm in no place to judge. He wiped his eyes. I said, it's just when I was a little kid, same preschool, I had a special friend, albeit not with the same visions as you. His name was Clark. He was a handicapped, always fixing up people's toys and giving people cool stuff while asking nothing in return. I said, go on. I said, well, in a few months of, a few months of playing and having fun, I decided I should do something special for him. I was making a gift and had a chocolate-making kid. I figured his inventions... With all his inventions, what would he need with another robot? I went to deliver it to him, but I wasn't watching where I was going, and suddenly I felt something hit me hard in the middle of the street and knock it out of my hand. I said, oh no. I said, what hit me was soft and fluffy. When I came to, I saw Clark laying in the street bleeding. I called out for help, and he was taken away to a hospital. I went to visit him, the gift still in my possession, despite being knocked out of my hand. Initially. Clark told me that many of his vital organs had been hit, but he was happy to have known me despite it being rather brief. He saw the gift in my hand and smiled. I opened it for him as he'd no use of his arms or legs. I fed him the chocolate and he said it was the best he'd ever had and no one had ever given him anything before apart from his parents. Once I'd given him all I made, he told me what I'd not since forgotten. No matter what mistakes we make, our darkest thoughts, fantasies, or whatever, everybody has them. Everybody has feelings, some good, some bad, and everybody deserves someone who cares. I know you will one day. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, had I known those would be the last words I'd hear from him, 
I knew where the last time I'd see him might have stayed with him longer until his last breath. Claude held Lewis a little tighter, and Lewis swore he saw the spirit of Clark take hold of Claude and speak. I'm in a better place, Lewis, and I wasn't wrong. You found someone who cared. It took four years, but you did. I said, but I killed you. Had I not wandered in the middle of the road, you'd still be alive. No, I made the choice to rescue you, and the car that hit me was the one I'd made an appointment to fix for the very reason it hit me. The brakes needed repair. Now go and be happy. This is my wish to you. You're the best friend anyone could ask for. We will meet again soon enough, so enjoy your time while you have it. Claude returned to normal. Weird, I felt a chill, and I went blank for a second. Can you loosen up a bit? You're suffocating me. I said, I'm sorry you had to hear my story, but that's why no matter what I saw yesterday, I vowed never to abandon you, not when you needed unconditional companionship as much as me. I won't abandon you. Claude said, oh, Louis. Both stopped talking and silently cried themselves to sleep in each other's arms. Others know, wow, that was so sad. I even cried through a good chunk of writing it, not gonna lie. It's just so sad and cute, I can't. I guess the next chapter is at Claude's house. All right, to be continued, sniff. <laughs> okay, and what the hell, I'm just gonna read the fourth one. I'll pick this up again later in a future series, maybe. But for now, I leave you with this last piece. New Life, New Strife by the Pacific Scribe. Chapter 4, Nightmare, Night Scare. Dateline, June 25th, 1998. Midnight had come on our adorable cuties who had bawled themselves to sleep. What could they be dreaming of? Inside Lewis's dreamland, there was sunshine and rainbows and a happy clog skipping around in the most effeminate way you could imagine. All seems good, no? Well, let's look at Claude. We see storm clouds in his dream, thunder, lightning, and shadows moving about the place, a voice beckoning him. You cannot escape who you are, Claude. Claude is shivering in his sleep, his projected self trying to cover its ears. That won't help you. I mean your mind, fool. Go ahead and run. You cannot escape what you know you are. Your friend cannot help you here. Memories of those who teased and taunted him in his previous school materialize and begin speaking in unison. Faggot. Queer. What's that? You want a boy? You. And we thought girls were gross. You are a girl. Everybody knows you'll never be a proper man. You'll be alone. It's only a matter of time. No, stop. Leave my brain alone. Spaz, this world is no place for one as mental as you. You want us all dead? How cute. And just how will you do that? You're hopeless. You'll never learn to function as we do. Don't lie to yourself. We even scared your friend. He'll leave you eventually. They always do. Accept your fate and become the vindictive monster you know you are, and you can make this all go away. No, I'm not like you. I can't hurt a soul even as you taunt me to no end. What if we do this, then? An image of his best friend tied up behind them makes itself known. Let him go now. Never. <laughs> Never. Claude finally gets fed up. Yes, give in to the hate. Let it consume you. He began beating up the shades of the ones. He knew them disappearing on impact until he finally reached his best friend. I said, hello, Claude. Thanks for saving me. Claude said, any time, bud. Saving me the trouble of ending you myself. Lewis pulled a blade and slit the image of Claude's throat. Claude could feel the pain in his neck in real life and woke up hyperventilating. It was now 2 a.m. I said, ow, my neck. Whew. At least it was only a dream, and it's going away now that I'm awake. But I don't want to sleep anymore. He then noticed Lewis was holding him like a teddy bear. Oh, how could I dream he'd hurt me? Claude licked Lewis's cheek, purring loudly as Lick flick, Lewis uh, <laughs> flicked his foxtail straight up. I said, I suppose I don't have to tell him what I just did when he wakes up. <laughs> Claude then seized the chance to brush his face off with Lewis's fluffy tail, which caused Lewis to blush greatly and probably did something to him below the belt. Lewis woke up. I said, oh, hey, Claude, what you doing up so early? Oh, dear, I gotta pee. <laughs> Lewis went to the bathroom, shut the door, and one could hear the sound of pee hitting the toilet bowl as he'd lifted a leg to do so like a canine species. He then came back to the bed where Claude held him tightly. Lewis said, Claude, what happened? You look like you'd seen a ghost. Claude said, I saw a vision in my sleep. The monster materialized my worst enemies and fears, and Lewis shushed him and held him close, rubbing his back down to his tails. It's okay, Claude, I know you won't become him. It is because you can see these visions you can prevent yourself from becoming him. I trust you and would never hurt you even if you did become him. Besides, even if you did go so far as to end me, I'd get to be with my other friend in the afterlife, so either way I'm happy. Claude said, I have to pee too. Claude ran to the same toilet and flushed. And the 
though flushed, could smell the distinct scent of Lewis. Ah, something about smelling a familiar creature in here is soothing. On all fours, he dropped his drawers and leaned over the hole like a cat in a litter box and peed into it. He then tried to bury it as one of his tails flushed the toilet. He then pulled up his pants and returned to bed. I said, hey, I, could s I can smell your scent mixing with mine in the bathroom. I said, yep, same, even our smells are inseparable. Both went back to bed, cuddling to sleep as we returned to dreamland. Now in Lewis's mind. Hey, Lewis, want to play? Clark? That's right. I'm here with you. Lewis ran to Clark, but ne neither seemed to get any closer nor farther from him. Don't you want to play? I thought you liked me. Is it possible you're weighted down by something? Clark's face turned to one of compassion to one of resentment. Maybe you are to blame? You know, if you'd not ran into the street, I'd still be alive. It's your fault. Your fault. Your fault. The last line echoed repeatedly. You cannot go back from what you've done. And worse still, I've seen what will happen to your friend. I've seen all possibilities. Either he will become a monster and leave you, kill you, or worse, your carelessness will lead to his untimely demise, too. Clark's parents materialized. Murder! Our son liked you. He was incapable of hating you. Know it. You can run, but you cannot escape who you are. Suddenly, Claude showed up looking seemingly innocuous at first. I said, hello, best friend. I pose a simple yet deep question for you. Do you love me? Yes, to death. Clark, Claude's face turned menacing. Yes, I have no desire to continue living with this guilt anymore. Anything you do to me would be a mercy. I said, oh, sad. I warned you that you shouldn't bother with me. You still bonded with me. Now I see it was the death wish all along. I said, you're wrong. Don't you remember? I'll deserve someone to care for them. Even as you and my departed friends smite me for my mistakes, I don't hate either of you. I can't hate any of you. You're nothing more than my internal guilt, and I saw my friend had forgiven me and told me one of us would have died that day either way. You all want me to be happy, so damn it, I'll be happy. The shade slowly began to disappear. The dark clouds subsiding as things went back to being happy again. Even Claude slept a little better after that until morning. The next morning came and both woke up blushing at how close they were, no longer being in a sleepy daze. I said, huh? Hey, um, it seems like you had a nightmare too. I don't blame you. I can't imagine what it must be like to have accidentally led to a friend's death, but if there's anything I've figured out in the last 24 hours, it's that we're not going to leave each other anytime soon. Come with me. I said, I believe you're correct. We need each other. Who else will comfort each us in these trying times? I said, our parents? I said, but we're undergoing it together. Is that not special? I said, yeah. We said, that's why no matter what happens, we must make a pact to be there for each other. I said, are you suggesting we cut our hands and shake on it? I said, nothing like that. Just we need a symbol or a logo. Cut it in two and then whenever we're alone, we have a piece of the whole. And when we're together, we form something beautiful. I said, hmm, how about this? Claude drew a yin and yang symbol and cut it up, giving the yang to Lewis while keeping the yin for himself. I said, perfect. As if by instinct, Lewis held Claude's hand paw. Lisa said, do you love birds about ready for breakfast? Do you all are going to Claude's house tonight after... Both turned to each other with a disgusted question. Ew, love, really? But that chapter concluded. Author's notes said, wow, that went from dark to cute in 60 seconds. I figured after the last chapter's sad ending, perhaps it was time to have them strengthen their bond a bit. They may not know it yet, but that weird feeling that keeps them from wanting to be apart is a force called love. Given how dense they are, it is unlikely they'll know what to do with it for a while. Then again, I'm not sure how many more chapters can be cleaned as they've already done some pretty lewd or intimate things without really crossing the line so far. Though if you've never been to camp, I hear no innocence survives it, and that's usually where one finds out which way they swing. Then again, they say a lot of things about camp. I wouldn't know. Either way, I have my work cut out for me to avoid the many opportunities to turn this into an adult work. Wish me luck, as always. Yeah, this was actually a try not to make it adult um, challenge that I wrote this for originally. And that's the first four chapters. I figure that's about enough for today. I'm going to maybe, you know, write that Konoru poem in, in ink for for them, but you've already seen me do that on Wednesday, so... I think this is a good logical stopping point. I thank you all for tuning in, and um, until next time, bye!